Webb discovers auroras on Neptune and measures the exact size of asteroid 2024 YR4, the first private mission to carry humans on a polar orbit. A mission that could reach and explore Mercury using only a solar sail. And in our bonus story on Patreon, what would it take to build a sample return mission to Io? All these stories and more in this week's Space Bites. Neptune is the farthest planet in the solar system. Don't say me emails about Pluto. And we've only visited it one time up close with Voyager 2 back in 1989. We've never gone back. Now, we can do the next best thing, which is use the most powerful telescope ever made to capture images of Neptune and bring Neptune to us. And so we've got some new images that have come from James Webb of Neptune. What makes this image really cool and scientifically useful is that Webb detected auroras on Neptune for the first time. Now we know that there are auroras here on Earth. They've been seen on Jupiter, on Saturn, on Uranus, and they're caused when the particles coming from the sun, from the solar wind, from coronal mass ejections and flares, interact with the magnetic field around the planet. We know that Neptune has a magnetic field, but we've never seen these auroras before. And the hint is the presence of trihydrogen cation. This contains three hydrogen atoms and two electrons, and it's a strong indicator of aurora activity on a planet. And so while we wait for the new mission to Neptune that will come someday, uh, we can see these cool images from Webb. Now we've got a lot of more information on universetoday.com, story written by Mark Thompson. And then another piece of James Webb news, and that is that Webb was finally called in to examine asteroid 2024 YR4. And if you don't remember YR4, this was the asteroid that had a non-zero chance of hitting Earth in 2032, which has now been downgraded to essentially a zero chance of hitting Earth with a slight chance of hitting the moon. And as soon as it was discovered, and as soon as its dangerous trajectory was mapped out, then people booked time on web. But it shouldn't be surprising that the risk was downgraded. And yet, this is the smallest asteroid that Webb has ever looked at, and it was able to measure very accurately the size. It's 60 meters across, so imagine a building tumbling in space. And in addition, Webb was also able to measure the spin rate of the asteroid and even get a sense of its surface characteristics. It doesn't have a fine sand on its surface. It probably has fist sized rocks or larger across its surface. And yet it doesn't share any characteristics with any other known asteroids in the area. And so it was actually very useful that Webb was able to do some science on this asteroid. And again, we've got a story on Universe Today by Mark Thompson the first private polar mission. So this one snuck up on me. This is another private mission using a SpaceX Dragon capsule. It launched earlier this week, and it went into a very cool orbit, went into a polar orbit. Now, most of the time when missions launch, they go around the equator, and that's because you can get the least amount of fuel, you can launch the most amount of payload into this equatorial orbit. But there's a lot of interesting science that can be done if you take a polar orbit, of course, looking at the poles of the Earth. The previous record holder was the Soviet Vostok 6 mission, which launched at 65 degrees. And so this is 90 degrees over both of the poles. On board, you've got the cryptocurrency billionaire Chun Wan and three crewmates, Norwegian commander Yannick Milkinson, German pilot Rebea Raga, and Australian medical officer and mission specialist Eric Phillips. And so it was hard to kind of categorize this. It's the first polar mission carrying humans, but also the first private polar mission carrying humans. So it's both. Now they only launched for a handful of days and by the time you're watching this video they will have already landed or they're about to land but they got a lot of science done while they were in space they performed 22 experiments and two that I thought were really cool one was to grow mushrooms in space and then the second one is to perform x-rays of the human body while in space and these are two things that have not been done before. And again, another story written by Mark Thompson on Universe Today. A mission that could reach Mercury on solar sails alone. Mercury is the most difficult planet to reach in the solar system, which is surprising because I'm sure you imagine why don't you just fall down into the sun. But the problem is that you've got to cancel the Earth's orbital velocity. It's actually 
about the same difficulty to get out of the solar system as it is to get down to Mercury. And so missions that try to get all the way down into the inner solar system, they have to either use a lot of propellant or they do a bunch of gravitational assist. And this is what we saw with Bepi Colombo. This is what we saw with the Parker Solar Probe. You use these planets, you use their gravity to slow yourself down until you're able to have the right trajectory and the right speed. But at the recent Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which you're going to hear me talk about a lot in this and a lot of more future videos, there was a really cool proposal, which was that you could use a solar sail mission to get to Mercury. Now you might be going like, how can you use a solar sail to get closer to the sun? Shouldn't it be getting pushed away from the sun? But you have to think about orbital mechanics. When you have a spacecraft that is in orbit around the sun, then if you want to raise its orbit, you want to get farther away from the sun, then you increase your velocity in the direction that you're traveling. And then that raises your orbit. And if you want to lower your orbit, then you decrease your velocity in the direction that you're traveling and that lowers your orbit. And so if you launch a solar sail, it's going to be in orbit around the sun. And then it just depends on the angle. If you set your solar sail at a diagonal, then the light pressure from the sun will bounce off and speed up the velocity of the solar sail, which will cause it to raise its orbit, cause it to move farther away from the sun. But if you go 180 degrees from that, then the photons coming from the sun will decrease the velocity of the solar sail and cause it to spiral inward towards the sun. Ironically, the closer you get to the sun, the more light pressure you experience, then the more force you're applying. And so the faster you can decrease your altitude and eventually you could spiral right into the sun. But what if you wanted to get to Mercury? And so this cool mission concept has a spacecraft in the middle of this giant solar sail, and that's its main propulsion system. And this would be a discovery class mission and it would only weigh about 250 to 300 kilograms. It would launch into Earth orbit and then would use this solar sail to slowly lower its orbit until it finally got into orbit around Mercury. It would take about seven years, but if they had a much larger solar sail, they could drop that time down to about four years. And I just love this idea of using solar sails as a way to move around in the solar system because it gives you options. Like once you're at Mercury, you could change your orbit. You could leave Eve Mercury and go to Venus if you wanted to. And so I think this is a really cool idea. And in fact, I've reached out, I'm gonna be doing an interview next week with the people behind this concept. And we've got a really interesting story on Universe Today written by David Dickinson. Gaia's mission's over and it rides off into the sunset. Now I have already brought you the sad news about the Gaia mission, which is that it wrapped up earlier this year. Once all of the data was sent back home, then ESA gave the command to wipe all of its memory and then push the spacecraft into a safe parking orbit. And so on March 27th, 2025, ESA controllers deactivated the subsystems and sent it off into its retirement orbit. And Gaia taught us so much. We learned that the Milky Way has a warped shape, that it doesn't have two big spiral arms, but this kind of feathery collection of spiral arms. The central bulge is in a sphere. It's more of a squashed spheroid. It helped find the siblings of the sun. It's going to find tens of thousands of exoplanets. It charted the positions, the movements of more than a billion stars in the Milky Way, and now it's gone. But the science is still coming, and that is because the people working with it are still crunching all the data. They've got two more data releases coming out, one in a couple of years. The final one will come in 2030. But that's it. Guy is gone. It's gone. But if you want more information, you should definitely check out this article on Universe Today by Brian Koberlein. Every week we do a vote on our channel where we ask you to tell us what you thought was the best space news story of the week. And the winner this week was long chain hydrocarbons found on Mars. So thank you everybody who voted in the poll. Now we will post the new poll into the post tab here on YouTube within about 24 hours of when we release this video. So if you have the time or if you're just scrolling on YouTube and you see the vote, let us know what you think. Now, the best chance to see this is to subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, and then just obey the algorithm in all ways. An electromagnetic moon dust shield. Lunar regolith is one of the biggest hazards of lunar exploration. This is the glass-like powdered rock that is smashed up 
on the surface of the moon and this stuff gets everywhere. During the Apollo mission, the astronauts had runny noses, they were coughing, this stuff was getting into their machinery, their equipment into their spacesuits. And over long periods of time, it will probably cause health issues, it'll get into the machinery, gum up the works, break things. So NASA needs a way to stay on top of this and minimize its interaction. And so there's a couple of things that they've been working on one is different kinds of material that may repel or attract this uh, regolith powder. But the other is an electromagnetic shield. And so one thing that's important to understand is that this regolith is not just greedy and gets into everything. It's actually electrostatically charged, which means that it will be attracted to various things that have the negative charge. And so you actually get this dust kicking up during the course of a lunar month. And so it'll actually just lift up move and then adhere to various surfaces on your spacecraft. And of course, then it can start to get into your astronaut lungs get into your equipment and block solar panels over time. And so something that I'm sure many of you have been wondering, like, why don't they have some way to repel it? And NASA has been working on this and they tested out the new system on the blue ghost one lander. And it worked. So you can see here, there's a couple of different types of material, one that doesn't have the electromagnetic repellent, and then one that does. And you can see how there's a lot less dust. And of course, once this technology has been tested out on the moon, you can imagine it playing a role for future missions to Mars, making sure that the Martian dust, which is very similar, so it doesn't collect on the solar panels doesn't get on their camera systems and so on. So this problem might be starting to get solved. Now we've got a really cool story about this on universe today by Evan Goff. Planetary disks are small, about 4.5 billion years ago, the solar system formed out of a giant cloud of gas and dust. And as the material came together, you got the sun forming at the center, and then the whole cloud spun up and you got this accretion disk, a protoplanetary disk around the star where the planets started to form. And one of the most amazing advances in the last decade or so is our ability to directly image these protoplanetary disks using the Atacama large millimeter array. This is a radio telescope system that's in Chile, we've seen the different shapes and structures that these protoplanetary disks take. And so a team of researchers wanted to know how are they in general. And so they analyzed all of the protoplanetary disks they could find in one star forming region, and they ended up finding 73 separate disks, and then they were able to compare them all. So they're able to see their sizes, their consistency, which ones had planets forming inside of them. And what they found was really surprising that in general, protoplanetary disks are small. So on average, they were about the size of Jupiter's orbit in Earth, which is you know, when you think about the size that our protoplanetary disk must have been to include Uranus and Neptune and Pluto uh, and the Kuiper belt to have these disks only go out to the orbit of Jupiter. And in fact, the smallest one was even smaller than the orbit of Earth. And so you know, we always wonder is our solar system normal, and it might be that in fact, our planetary disk was abnormally large, unusually large compared to what else is out there. And we've got a great story about this on universe today by Carolyn Collins Peterson. And finally, let's get into some cool images. First up, this is an Einstein ring. And this is actually a collaboration between the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb. And what you're looking at is a giant elliptical galaxy in the center, which is relatively close part of a galaxy cluster. And then it is acting as a natural lens for a spiral galaxy that is billions of light years away farther behind it. And because the gravity of the galaxy is acting like a lens, the spiral galaxy is twisted into this perfect Einstein lens around the central galaxy. It's a beautiful picture. And we've got a story about this by Brian Koberlein on universe today. And then we've got first light from NASA's sphere X mission. And this is a mission that just launched a few weeks ago. And yet already, we've got first light. Now this spacecraft is part of the giant collection of ground based telescopes and space based telescopes that are trying to understand the evolution of the universe over time, what is the influence of dark matter? What is the influence of dark energy until so spherex has a really cool trick. Uh, it's got six separate 
scientific instruments that are able to map out the sky. Each chunk is about 20 times the size of the full moon. It maps in infrared and then it creates a spectrum of 102 hues in each exposure. And so normally when space telescopes try to capture images at different wavelengths, they use a filter wheel. So they turn the filter wheel, they only let in one wavelength of light, and then they turn the filter wheel and they only let in a different wavelength of light. And then that's what the astronomers use to study the region. But what Spherix does is it uses this rainbow. So it actually is capturing all the different wavelengths at the same time. So which wavelengths are blocked change from top to bottom. And so far, everything has been going great. Spacecraft has tested out just fine. And now it's about to begin its survey operations. And we've got a story about this on Universe Today from Mark Thompson. Now you're watching this week's Space Bites, but I am writing my weekly Guide to Space newsletter, which covers many, many more stories that we're not going to talk about here on YouTube. For example, Earth bacteria could survive on the moon for decades. And this is a really interesting question that we want to know how hardy are Earth bacteria and are the conditions on the moon able to kill them? And the answer is not quickly. So we've got a story about that from Lawrence Tognetti. Subsurface habitats on the moon could be grown using mushrooms and inflatable robots. We're always looking for new ways to build habitats on the moon and Mars out of local materials. So what about mushrooms? And this is a story by Matt Williams. How can we find cryovolcanoes on Europa? We know there's cryovolcanoes on Enceladus, but what about Europa? Well, we've got two missions on their way right now. Will they be able to find them? This is a story by Matt Williams. And finally, we've learned that spaceflight weakens our weight bearing bones the most. They sent mice to space. They found that weightlessness affected their femurs, but not their vertebrae. And this is a story by Mark Thompson. So if you want to subscribe, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's completely free. I write every word. There's no ads. And I send it out every Friday to 70,000 of my closest friends. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. I hate ads. I've removed them everywhere I can, but there's a bunch here on YouTube that I'm not able to remove. And so we've got a version of this video over on Patreon that we call Space Bites Plus. It's totally free for everyone. You don't have to sign up. And not only do you get this episode, but there's one bonus story. And this week's bonus story is about a sample return mission from IO. Wouldn't you like to know about that? So I'll put a link in the show notes so you can access that story. I'm going to talk about some television shows that I'm really excited about. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Boddy, Caredwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Math, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hans Schultz, Hudson Moore, Jay Graves, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Lawrence Federico, Marcel Smits, Michael Purcell, Paul Robach, Rinkaidu, Robeck, John Sargent, SpiderSwap.io, Stephen Fowler Munley, Thomas L. Scadron, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So there are two TV shows that I am really excited about, and I recommend that you go and watch the previous versions of these so that you will be caught up and ready to go when the new seasons arrive. And so the first one is The Last of Us Part Two. And The Last of Us Part One from HBO was really good. I I think it was the best video game adaptation that's ever been made. And it was relatively straightforward because if you've ever played The Last of Us, the video game is a movie. <laughs> and so all they had to do was just follow the story. They had one job and uh, they did it. And so the first season was terrific. And now I'm really looking forward to season two. And that's going to be coming out in late April. But the other one, the one that I'm really excited about, and this is Andor season two. Andor was a prequel to the movie Rogue One. And, you know, I say a lot of mean things about them raising the lurching corpse of Star Wars and bringing out more TV shows and stuff for kids and cartoons and so on. But Andor was fantastic. Andor is the best Star Wars thing that has come out in years. In fact, I think Andor is the best Star Wars thing ever. So, uh, you know, based on that, I'm really excited to see Andor. That's going to be coming out on Disney. So if you want two shows, you got to catch up and you can join in the zeitgeist as we're all enjoying Andor season two 
and Last of Us Season 2. All right, we'll see you next week.